Hi guys, welcome back. Uh, this is Matt Shett, episode 475, featuring an interview with Richard Moss. Uh, now, Richard has done a lot of wonderful things, but in this interview, uh, we're going to focus in on his book, The Secret History of Mac Gaming. Now, he wrote that book a while a while back, but it was uh, you know popular enough that they wanted to uh, do a second version of it, so he expanded it. And this new version is going to be published by Bitmap Publishing. I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Uh, but anyway, he's got uh, so many great stories in here about uh, stuff you just, it's just going to blow your mind, this, the, the role that the Macintosh played uh, in the development of the modern games industry. Everything from games like Dark Castle, most people know about, uh, the origins of Myst, Deja Vu, Bungie. I mean, there's just tons of great stuff here. Uh, I'm not going to spoil it for you, though, because you need to watch this video. Uh, so anyway, uh, without further ado, here is Mr. Richard Moss. Hello, folks, and welcome. And as you can see, I am here today with Richard Moss. He is the author of a book I think you are going to want to hear about. This is The Secret History of Mac Gaming. Now, he's uh, released a new version, an expanded edition with even more stuff, uh, than the first game had but uh there's so much in this book i'm you know i don't remember the last time i've been this excited uh to get a book and just start diving into this richard i mean fantastic job i can see that <laughs> even from the first few pages i mean your passion for this platform and, and this history and, and the community around it it's all very inspiring and uh, very well written you know i have to say so <laughs> you know i was thinking about this what do you think we, I think this, even if you haven't ever even seen one of these classic Macs or you know nothing about the history of this, I think you would still really enjoy this book. Uh, I'm not sure if that person would get more or the person who did grow up with it, but, you know, again, maybe miss some things or just wants to reminisce in the nostalgia. I mean, <laughs> you probably heard from a lot of uh, different kinds of people about the book. So yeah, what are your thoughts on yeah. that? Yeah, I tried really hard when I was writing it. It, it was my first book. So that, that's a challenge in and, of, wow. in and of itself. Uh, I've written another one since then that's not out yet, but uh, it was my first book. So that had lots of challenges, but I tried as much as I could to write it for anyone, for a general audience. Um, I wanted to make sure that, I mean, it's right in the title, The Secret History of Mac Gaming. It, it's about the this history that uh, to so much of the world was a secret. It's not just let's reveal it to the fans or hear the great stories behind your favorite games. It's let's, uh, let's let everyone know that this Macintosh thing is actually a pretty cool gaming platform, or it was at least for a while uh, back in the, the 80s and 90s. And um, some of these games were important. Some of these games were innovative and, and, and very influential. And so the, that I think I even wrote right in the introduction, this book is about letting that secret out. Mm -hmm. and, and so in order to do that, I had to attempt. And I'm not sure whether I succeeded everywhere in the book. Maybe I didn't quite pull it off in some places, but attempt to make it accessible even if you have never touched a Mac. Well, I think you really succeeded in that. I think that would be well in line with the, the Macintosh's vision. <laughs> you know, this computer that wouldn't be so computery, you know, for lack, you put it much better in your book. Yeah, just looking mm. here at some of the, this is the, uh, what is this, the bitmap books page. You can go look at some of this design. Yeah. I was uh, really uh, happy with this, you know, because, you know, it's a book, you know, you want to have some clever designs, the creativity of the design of the book, as well as the writing, I think comes through here with these, <laughs> you know, the sort of timeline you put together with the, uh, using the Mac interface. I and mean, that's really cool. I mean, there's just so much we, we could get into here. Um, I was thinking of a, you know, maybe like a place to start this idea of the um, the reason it's secret or the reason not many people know about it and some of the material in the book about how uh, there was some tension behind the scenes about how to present this machine to the public you know do you want to uh, play up the games or do you want to downplay <laughs> you know, that side mm. of it it's a serious machine uh, and as well as some of the things that 
it did. It was the first personal computer to do a lot of things that we just take absolutely take for granted today. And frankly, took a <laughs> you know Microsoft a, what a decade to catch up to you know what this machine was doing. So maybe just uh, do something with that tangled mass of ideas. <laughs> <I'm sure. laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I I think it was Windows ninety five really that uh, is where Microsoft caught up uh, and and in some ways jumped ahead. Uh, the by then the mac was in all sorts of trouble apple was in turmoil but uh, that's a different story there um back at the beginning of the macintosh so uh, let, let's try and contextualize this for anyone who uh, is forgotten or is too young to remember uh, before the mac personal computers were basically just uh, command line interfaces to, to start up like you, you got a pc or you got uh, an Apple II or something, you start it up and you've got a command prompt, prompt and anything is possible from there, but you have no idea what to do unless you have memorized what the commands are to type in, to, to say, I want to load this program and, and run this thing, or I want him to get into basic and start doing some coding. Um, but then the Macintosh came along and, and the people at Apple had stolen a lot of ideas from uh, this research group at Xerox Park, uh, uh, the previous decade in, in the 1970s. And all that. Yeah, the, they built the the uh, Alto computer, which was sort of a, almost a prototype for the Mac, uh, as it turns out. And so Apple, a bunch of Apple people had visited Xerox and seen the Alto, and they were really inspired by it. And they wanted to make their own spin on this they wanted to polish the these ideas they had used a mouse for into the input uh you had a what's what we know as a, a, the desktop interface it was a metaphor that they had created at xerox uh and it's just based on this idea that you, know, you want you, you make your computer screen an analogy for your desk uh, at the time that was a new weird idea and at the same time, you had a, a what you see is what you get, a WYSIWYG uh, <laughs> for, for text editing. Uh, you had multiple fonts. Um, you had movable, draggable windows that could be resized. They could overlap with each other. Lots and lots of um, features to how this thing worked that we take for granted now were actually really new to people at the time. Yeah, I love the story in there about it. Or you tell the story of the guy who sits down at this thing and he's trying to figure out how do I use this mouse? And he actually has it upside down. And he's like, yeah. <laughs> Why is it going yeah. up and down? This is backwards. Oh my goodness. Exactly. Yeah. It's a wonderful story. So when they were building the Macintosh, uh, and and this will actually lead into some positioning stuff maybe for us uh, of why it wasn't a games machine. So when they're building the mouse, they're doing the building the Mac, they're doing testing. They, they get people in, see how they go using it. And they got this one guy in and they didn't tell him anything. They just gave him the Macintosh in a box and said, okay, you try and set it up, see how you go. And they're watching him from the next room. And so he, like he, guinea pig. <laughs> yeah, he gets it, he gets it out. He plugs it in, he sets it all up, manages to plug all the right bits in the right places. It's, it's nice idiot proof thing for him. But then when he sits down to start using it, he is holding the mouse backwards so uh let me see if i can get my mouse in position here so he's got his palm over the buttons or the button there's one there's a one button mouse back in those days he's got the, his palm over the button and he's got the 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 tail uh coming down his hand instead of out the top well that makes sense so, then, right i mean a mouse tail should be on the bottom right i mean <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> we're laughing. Yeah, it's, I can see why you would. I can understand this guy. You know, it's absolutely a, a logical thing for him to do. Hmm. But then he uh, he starts to try and actually use it, and so he moves his hand to the left, and it goes to the right, and he moves his hand to the right, and the cursor on the screen goes to the left. He moves it up, and it goes down. And he's, well, this is weird, but. Instead of going, well, what if I flipped it around and held it the other way? He just keeps going. You know, he's fallen down this rabbit hole. He's never seen a mouse before. He doesn't know how it works. So he just assumes this is how a mouse works. 
and he he keeps going and he gradually gets used to it and then when he comes out of the demo he says you know you got a really cool machine it took me a while to figure out this this mouse thing but this was great i really liked it <laughs> i was uh, i mean i remember playing around with macintoshes a little bit in school you know there was they had a lot of apple twos and i remember playing around with the with a mac i was a you know, my first exposure to the windows driven sort of interface was through the amiga platform Yes, that's where, you know, of course, growing up, you think, well, they did all this. It was Commodore that did all this without realizing, no, <laughs> you know, that they were taking these ideas. I guess it all goes back to that uh, Xerox thing. But, you know, just flipping through the book and looking at some of these, you know, the screenshots you have in there from all these games. Uh, I think you described it somewhere. You know, I'm, th I'm thinking like the classic black and white games like Dark Castle and uh, the Mac Venture mm -hmm. series. And, uh, you know, I've often, you know, I've, I've, you know, and I've done a few games. I'm talking to, I've talked to a few of those developers over the years, like Marsh, who did the uh, Deja Vu and the Shadowgate series. And, you know, some people would think the black and white and the grayscale, you know, what a crappy uh, aesthetic that is. But really, when you start looking at it, to me, it's a, it's got kind of a unique, uh, I guess, aesthetic to it, right? There's just nothing, you know, there's nothing that quite looks like, uh, a screen, you know, I have one here in my <laughs> zoom background. <laughs> mm. I can zoom out of the way so you can, you know, see that. But there's just something about that. You know, I'm terrible at trying to describe art and graphics. <laughs> but, but what is it about this, uh, this classic Mac uh, aesthetic that makes it so uh, unique? Mm. I, I think it, it, it's very evocative when when uh, people have drawn good. Uh, classic Mac art. It's very evocative of of a place or a thing or whatever it is they're trying to represent. And I guess it, it gets to the the simplicity of the black and white graphics is one element that uh, uh, it's it's like you're doing a sketch on paper with with charcoal or something. It's much the same thing. There's a raw beauty to it. Um, no, I've never made that connection to the charcoal, but that is. I think you got something mm. there. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, then on top of that, you. yeah, exactly. And on top of that, you've got uh, some really cool techniques that people would use, like dithering. Um, mm -hmm. So for anyone who doesn't know, this is where you basically have alternating dots of different colors. So in the case of the Mac, uh, the grays that you're seeing here, they're entirely made up by your brain. Because what's going on is if you zoom way in, that's just black dots on a white background but by uh putting them in certain patterns you create the illusion of different shades the exact ups oh there we go yeah so this is just kind of a cross hatch ah. and so people like mark stephen pierce who did the graphics for duck castle uh be the the image behind you, I think, was done by Tracy uh, Tracy Vanola, who was a wonderful uh, bitmap pixel artist. Uh, these people were masters of these techniques. The, they were, and and keep in mind also, you're holding the this 1980s mouse, and so you've got a rollerball in it. It uh, feels sort of like you're holding a deck of cards rather than these fancy laser mice we have now, and somehow they're managing to actually draw these painterly images it's a remarkable skill that these people had i've got a shot of dark castle here let's see if i can bring this up yeah just look at that yeah, i love that well this game here dark castle this is one that i hear most often talked about you know even though the book you know we're talking you got like we could talk about mist and the manhole and the, you know, the, the bungee, you know, thinking about what bungee did on this platform. And mm. uh, God, that's just, I'm blanking on another one. Of course, the Mac Venture series, but I mean, this Dark Castle game comes up all the time. Uh, you know, what is it about this game that made it so famous? Um, well, I think that, I guess there's a few possibilities there. Um, one, is uh 
connected to the reason why uh, it's also kind of infamous, uh, at infamous. least the, the, <laughs> the, the ports, the ports to, to some of the other platforms. Uh, I think the Amiga version is pretty good, but uh, the DOS version, uh, bit shaky. The, the console version is just awful. Uh, it, it's very poorly regarded. Sometimes people on YouTube say it's like the worst game ever, but they've never seen the Mac oh, those original. People on YouTube. <laughs> uh, it, it's very difficult. Uh, it, it's a really hard game. It, it's, it, it, it's very singular in the way that it controls. Uh, it, it wasn't like anything quite around at the time. You, you'd use your mouse to direct your guy's arm. Uh, up and down, and then he can throw rocks. And uh, running around the, the levels, you had to press a particular button to go up and down the stairs. If you didn't, you'd fall over. And then when you when you land, and this is connects to one of the other reasons why it's probably very fondly remembered, when you then land, he gets up and he's dizzy, and he starts going like, wah, wah, <laughs> as he spins around in a circle. And so it had digitized sound effects and voice characterizations and the voice characterizations were done by this uh, retired radio announcer and old crooner he was a singer in the 1950s uh, dick noel mm -hmm. who just happened to be a customer of silicon beach software a company that did dark castle he was a customer of one of their utility programs and he lived in the area uh, near them so they asked him, hey, would you mind doing this? And he's sure. And so they went, and this guy has done decades of radio commercials, so he could do voices for anything. And they show him the game, and they sit him, they sit him down with it. And he just starts sort of riffing on ideas for how things in the game could sound. And uh, so this is 1986. Uh, digitized sound effects are almost unheard of yeah i was thinking time. there's probably it must have been one of the very first yeah and in fact these guys at silicon beach software their previous game from about a year earlier had um, totally just wowed people had stolen the show at the first macworld expo in 1985 in february 1985 because they had devised this technique for playing digital sound samples on the Macintosh. Uh, turns out that Apple's engineers had put a four voice synthesizer into the Mac and they built a really basic sound driver. And these guys, they wanted to, for, for this game Airborne, they wanted to have a splash screen of a, like a soldier saluting. And it would say, Airborne, sir. But uh, they didn't know how they were going to get that sound in there. They thought maybe we'd do something like on the Apple II where you'd sort of just fake the sound with synthesizers. But the Macintosh is still so new. It came out in 1984 that there are no established ways to do this stuff. So Eric Zocker is, is going through the inside Macintosh manual. It's like a thousand pages of how the Macintosh works and all the philosophies behind uh, the the machine and he finds that there's this four voice synthesizer and a really simple sound driver it just nobody knows how has to, nobody has established a way to get those sounds onto the mac yet so they start investigating it and they record some sound onto a little handheld tape recorder and they go to a university phonetics lab and they get that digitized, then they, they write a little program to downsample it. And they use an acoustic coupler and a 300 board modem to transfer it to the Mac. And then they, they have to write a little program to play the sound. And so then finally, after all that work, they kind of cross their fingers and yes, it works. They hear, they're one of the couple of the first people ever to hear digital sound come out of the Mac. And they're so excited and enraptured that they're like, we've got to make this a huge component of our first game. And then later on the, the next game, Dark Castle. And so they then went 
through uh, this guy Eric Zocker's record collection and they picked out everything that they thought would be out of copyright they were very naive at the time they thought if it's out if, if it's here and it's from like the 1950s we can probably safely use it uh. so they find a recording of Ride of the Valkyries and they grab that and they use that as the introduction to the game and so then when they go to Macworld February 1985 they set up this table um that they're all bootstrapped so they they've brought their own fold-up tables from home and uh, uh, one of them has waist-high speakers so they've brought that along too and they set that up on the show floor they're right next to the ramp coming down into the well that expo area where everyone's showing off their stuff and they crank they, they hook the speaker up to the mac they crank up the volume and they set up one they set up this mac to just be a demo station and uh, the game loops if no one touches it it'll go into a demo mode and then it'll come back out of the demo and and play that song again and so every few minutes you hear the first four bars or so of ride of the valkyries and people are coming down the stairs and they're what is that sound as they hear the da -da 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 <laughs> music playing and so it drew a huge crowd. Even the Apple engineers came over and said, how did you do this? <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So then uh -huh. when Dark, Dark Castle came along, they, they built a more elaborate game and they got a proper illustrator in Mark Stephen Pierce in to do the graphics and the, and the level design. And he took all these ideas from arcade games because that was his background. And so long story short, that's how you wind up with this weird quirky and very evocative game that sounds and looks great it's definitely got its its own vibe i'm just kind of thinking about the the dark part of that is <laughs> it's kind of a sinister game but i mean i love stories like that because you you know it's like so uh, clever you know and then somebody to think about i mean the idea that even the engineers are like how did you do this i mean <laughs> It really kind of gets at this uh, sort of culture that you talk about in the book of the, you know, like the, this was not the, this is not the games industry as we know it today, <laughs> but, no. you know, by any means, it's like this, they're almost kind of like an underground type thing and all these clubs and they're sharing uh, uh, the software through the mail and through this, these shareware models and, you know, things that people you know, I assume most people watching this program know what, <laughs> what shareware is. And, uh, there's a lot of fascinating uh, stories like like that in the book. Uh, let's see. The I was trying to think of the one that um, or the role playing game got a start like that. The uh, one that I've got back here, not the dungeon reveal, but the one that came before it was called just uh, the uh, dungeon of doom. Yeah, the dungeon of doom. <laughs> <laughs> so you you were telling about uh you were telling the story of that game and how it came about and all these sort of false starts and and <laughs> i don't know i'll let you tell the story <laughs> mm. the yeah, and this is this is actually a story that uh, is new for the expanded edition so if anyone awesome. watching has has the first edition this could be a reason maybe for you for you grabbing it um so this guy, John Raymond's was a, a university student. Um, I think it was, I think it was MIT maybe. Uh, anyway, so he's, he's at one of the top universities in America and the Macintosh comes out and he just goes, Oh, I've got to have this. He, he's, and, and this is a very common story among people that I talk to for the book. The, they're so spellbound by this new machine, so enamored with what it can do that they simply must have it. And then when they have spent their life savings on buying the thing, because it wasn't cheap. How expensive was it when you adjust for inflation and all that? Uh, I think it was two and a half thousand US dollars in 1984 money which is that's, that's like several Apple, thousand that's like Apple several thousand least, dollars now i think you said the Apple yeah. it was like twenty five thousand dollars so this was relatively yes. cheap but still an expensive machine 
Yeah, and and that's why uh, indeed this was the computer for the rest of us because the the Lisa had done much the same thing. It was a little less polished, but uh, Apple had done had sold the Lisa a, a year before, and it was ten thousand dollars, which is about twenty four twenty five thousand in today's money. So that that's just astronomical amount of money that you you had to spend and poor Macintosh developers at the very beginning, those first two years, they had to have a Lisa if they wanted to make a Mac program. So they're, they're like out $30,000 in today's money just to have these two, two computers. And so John Raymond had, had seen the Lisa and then he, he saw the Macintosh and he just knew he had to have it. So he went out and he bought it and he, he spent all the money he had left buying a laser writer printer because that was also new and exciting laser printers that they, they were laser. not something that a normal person could get a hold of and so he's enjoying the the computer playing around with it playing with all the new stuff and then a c compiler comes out and suddenly he's like i can make stuff on my macintosh and so he's thinking about what could I do? Because he's a software engineering major, and he he wants uh, he's a so he's a hardware and he's doing um back this up. He he's not done any software engineering. He is doing electronic engineering, so he's dealing with the hardware, mm -hmm. and he wants to get more familiar with the software, and so he wants to make a program to 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 do that, and he had. A few months earlier, seen this game called Rogue. And oh, to yeah. people watching this will be very familiar. I'm sure there'll be lots lots of people who, who know Rogue. It better be. <laughs> <laughs> and he, like like many others who imitated Rogue, had not spent a great deal of time with it. I mean the the guy who made the kid who made hack, he'd spent what a, a weekend or a, an afternoon with it, and he just wanted to go and recreate it because he didn't have access to it anymore. This was a similar story where he'd he'd played Rogue for a few hours and he thought, this game's pretty neat. Maybe I should make my own version. And he'd also seen these couple of couple of other things. He doesn't remember the details but there was something that he recalls was sort of like rogue but it was graphical and it was on a battlefield instead of a dungeon and he thought well maybe i can use that idea and make rogue more accessible make rogue more graphical and so he just starts fiddling around and, and trying to make something and he, he's modifying the arcade game off the top of my head i can't remember which one it is that came with the c compiler and he just keeps fiddling around trying different things and gradually he puts together the foundations of what becomes the dungeon of doom and later on is released commercially as the dungeon revealed and it's a uh, it's pretty much a uh, a basic version of rogue you you click the mouse to uh move around your your guy who's drawn as a uh, an icon sized sprite moves around on these tiles every element in this game is uh icon sized uh, he wanted to to make it accessible so he got a friend to, to draw these these graphics uh, you can't see on this image here but uh, at the top of the screen when you're playing you've got the mac menu bar which gives you all the commands so you don't need to memorize anything back when you play rogue you had to learn what oh, 20 geez. 30 keyboard commands at, at least i mean all those games yeah. there, it was like z for the x remember <laughs> like ultima you, you really needed that uh, little reference card or whatever you know close by I mean, just looking yeah. at the graphics on this, I mean, doesn't that just suck you in and make you want to play this? Just looking at this. <laughs> this is a CRPG addicts. Looks like he's played it. Mm. Yeah. And and so all the commands are, are up there in, in the oh, top menu go. bar. Here he is. Okay. Yeah, there we go. This one. So like here, instead of having to memorize, you know, like what, whatever that is, Apple U, whatever, you don't, you could just go up here to the menu. 
if I wear armor. Yeah. Yeah, you just it's like you a just simple thing, but if you mess up, <laughs> it's only simple because somebody like this did it, <laughs> and everybody else uh, copied it, right? Mm. And and even better, uh, what you can see right here is that nearly all the options are actually grayed out because you don't have a potion to drink, you don't have a scroll to read, you don't have an item to throw. I suppose uh, it's just eat food, wear armor, or wield weapon. Those are the only three options that are actually valid right here so uh, it's also sort of pointing you in the direction of what you need to do it's it's making the game much much more accessible now see that's the sort of thing i would not have even have thought about <laughs> so like even like the fact that some of these are grayed out is, is clever design yeah because they could have just yeah. had like a lesser game all this would be lit up you'd be like zap one come on zap one <laughs> why isn't that doing anything well, I can't, this will physically not let you click it. Yeah. So that is something else that a lot of developers in, in these early days of the Mac were, were doing because they were all Macintosh users and Apple had done a brilliant job with the Mac of making something that taught you how to do good design. Uh, that they had their human interface guidelines that they wrote and they no longer follow, sadly. Uh, but <laughs> these were the rules by which you should design software. And they had used them most perfectly in the Finder, so the desktop of the Macintosh, and in Mac Paint, this wonderful program that you showed just before, a, a, an illustration in. Yeah, we can look at that again because that's a pretty revolutionary program. Yeah, Mac Paint was cited almost as often as the Macintosh itself as an inspiration by the, the developers that I spoke to, because it just worked so perfectly. You had the these two tool palettes, the one on the side there that's uh, got all your different commands. And then on the bottom there, you had some patterns you can choose between for how uh, when you draw a, a rectangle or you do uh, an autofill of the whole area or you use the spray cam, whatever tool it is you're using, it'll automatically fill it with that chosen pattern. And then up the top, you had this menu bar, which had some extra stuff. You could choose what font you wanted for your text, what font size. Uh, there were some extra bits in there, goodies, yeah. Goodies. Uh, <laughs> it's like if you candy. <laughs> I mean, Goodies you is just this, this, this extra screed, stuff. Uh, I mean, yeah, you, you try to mess around with like Adobe Photoshop and it just is so overwhelming. You're like, oh my God, I don't even know how to make a box in this thing. Uh, it's just kind of puts you off immediately. Uh, whereas this, even somebody like me, again, with pretty much zero artistic talent, <laughs> you know, I can just look at this. It makes me want to... Uh, just play around with these tools and I feel like I can, it's almost just obvious what things do without mm -hmm. even having to like click on them and stuff. And, you know, I, I played around with the deluxe paint on the Amiga. I was, I don't know if that, I guess I must've, was that based on this or what's the relationship? I, th I think it was inspired oh, by inspired. this. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know to what extent, uh, I don't know whether they just like sort of ripped it off and then, ran with it or or something else i've not looked into the story but yeah this makes you want to tinker around with it and i guess you could use this program to make uh, gra uh, graphics for your games a lot of people did yeah it and yes it, it very much invites you to play with it and this actually sort of wraps around to what we we're talking about at the beginning of why macintosh wasn't seen as a games platform mm -hmm. so uh Apple had built something so inviting and so playful that people worried it wasn't a serious machine. Uh, the original idea with the Macintosh was that it would be this very inviting thing. It would be almost like an appliance. Uh, it would just be something you have in your house that you can use. It's, it's another tool. It's a it's a system to help you get things done. Uh, 
I think you said you could put it in a sack and bring it home with you if you <laughs> Yeah. And the, that all-in-one design there, that's intentional. They wanted something that was portable. So you know, it's not uh, super portable. It's not like a Mac Mini or something today. But if you think of like a um, bookshelf speaker, uh, it's sort of that size. So, so it's something that you can certainly pick up and carry in a bag with you if you so desire and set up in another place my friend gave me his and he literally had it in like a leather bag and especially made for like you know it's like a backpack straps to carry this thing around so i mean people were definitely doing that yeah absolutely and so between the uh, sort of almost cute appearance of it which was it was much less boxy than a typical computer which would sort of be this boring flat uh, thing uh, and the fact that it had these graphics and computers were supposed to be difficult to use because serious people need to put in serious effort in order to uh, master this complicated thing because otherwise how can it be of worth uh, this was the weird backwards thinking people had you know, and nobody ever got fired for buying an ibm yeah and they had basically all the different elements coming together to make people feel like this thing is too much fun to use. How can something so joyful be a serious tool with which to complete serious work? And Apple's marketing team got really scared when they heard wind of all the people in the Fortune 1000, Fortune 500 space saying, we think this is a toy. And they got really scared and they, they do these demonstrations like we we talked about the guy was trying uh trying to work out how to use a mouse they do focus groups as well where they get a bunch of people in the room to all play around with different programs and in most of these demos they had a couple of games because they had built games inside of apple or the macintosh that's how they would uh, test out a lot of new features there are two different versions of of maze war the the classic 1970s uh first person shooter maze game thing uh the this beautiful game that they put out in 1984 alongside the macintosh called alice or through oh, yeah, the looking alice. glass that's a great the, story in and of itself right there yeah and we can go back to that later if you like um so they had these different games that they built and they would include them in some of the focus groups and they kept kept getting feedback that this thing is too fun to use it's too fun to it's not boring enough yeah i'm not sure i can do serious work with this because it's so much fun to use and they got so scared of all that that they backed away from any placement of it as a games machine that they they just they pulled so far back uh, instead of going overcorrected almost yeah instead of going like the apple II, which would had been designed as a games machine by steve wozniak uh instead of going sure go play games it's a fun machine it's a computer it's meant to be an appliance for your home and what what's one of the things that you do with a, a an appliance that's kind of cool and fun is you can play with it so games would encourage that playfulness but they backed up because they wanted people to use this machine in their offices. They wanted companies to buy a whole bunch of them. They backed right up. No, no, no. This is a serious computer, serious work. You don't play games on it. And it wasn't until they shifted focus four years later or so to the education market that they really made any effort to acknowledge that people might want to put games on it. And then a couple of years after that, they got Craig Fryer in as the first Mac games evangelist. And so from then on, they sort of uh, had this seesaw of games are important. Games don't matter. Games are important. Games don't matter. <laughs> Depending on what the focus was. They're coming from with that, but you know, and you got to think too, again, of the context of this, you know, this is well before Google and companies like that. I remember you were talking in here about how the, Apple itself, you'd come in and there'd be like bean bags in there and it's like this play, playful atmosphere. And I guess the 
the, <laughs> the run of the mill CEO would walk in there and be like, Oh my God, what is this? Nobody's taking them. I'm, you know, you almost worry about your investment at that point, right? Can these guys be trusted not to, you know, are they just playing around? Yeah. And they're running around the office with Nerf guns shooting. Yeah. At the <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it kind of makes sense now when people were saying, well, you don't get fired for buying an IBM, right? Because if you buy this and it turns out to be not a serious machine, then suddenly you've bought, you know, 10,000 of these computers and you're in trouble with your boss. <laughs> mm. I want to go back to that Alice game a little bit. I've seen if I can yeah. get a picture of it because that, that was quite a good story in the book. Oh, come on, where is it? Not that Alice game. <laughs> okay, what? Well, you go ahead and start talking about it, and I'll see if I can find a picture of it. Yeah, so, okay. Uh, Alice was made by a guy called Steve Capps. He designed the Macintosh Finder. Uh, he, um, he worked at Xerox in 1980, and he was actually working on this Alto computer that inspired, uh, inspired Apple with the Mac. And he, while he was there, built a couple of demos that he was playing around with. Uh, one of them was, a, uh, there was a maze generator thing that also ended up coming out for Mac as amazing. And there's this other one he called Alice. It was kind of like you took chess and you replaced all the white pieces with Alice from Alice in Wonderland. So she can play any of the pieces, but only one at a time. Uh, she takes on the role. So right there in that video, uh, looks like she was playing the queen because she's going in any direction. And so at the start, you choose what, what piece Alice is going to stand in for. And then it's a real time game. So chess is a very thoughtful game that you take a lot of time with and here he turned it into this manic arcade title that uh yeah it moves if quick. you if you don't stop clicking you're you're pretty much gone you're done for because the black pieces on the other side they don't wait they just you know move okay next one moves next one moves next one moves it just it's constant and so you got to keep moving and if you're standing on a square when they move to that square you lose your life. And uh, what, what was happening is uh, at Apple, he remade this game for the Lisa and the Lisa team got so excited that they started playing it all the time. And then when he moved over to the Macintosh team, they were like, please make your, make your Alice game, make this chess thing again. And so he did that. And then one of the, the people there, Joanna Hoffman, she's so good at the game that she kept pressuring him to make it more difficult. She's like, it's too easy. It's too easy. So he keeps ramping up the challenge. It, it gets faster. He starts popping in those holes that appear in the floor that she can fall through. And he even at one point does an invisible board option. If you, uh, there's a, a secret, a secret key invisible command or board? something. And you can play it with an invisible board. <laughs> I think that would be enough challenge for. Yeah. And so he, looking back on it, he saw this as, as a mistake because he was just trying to impress his friends. But then what happened was when Apple was thinking about, we should have some games for the Macintosh, they decided this would be one of those games. And he had designed this thing just for his friends. So it was way too difficult for a consumer audience uh, when it eventually came out. Uh, if you were one of the poor saps who bought this thing in 1984 and you tried to play it and you've never used a mouse before, imagine how difficult it would have been doing what you just saw in that video. And you're still trying to get the hang of, hang on, when I move the mouse, it goes over here. <laughs> you got to figure out which, <laughs> which, way to, which way to turn the mouse. I mean yeah and so then what happened was uh in 1983 uh apple's marketing team 
changed their mind about whether games were important. And and Steve Jobs corners Steve Caps in a men's room. Uh, I don't know why it had to be a men's room, but he corners him there and says, you know, I'm sorry, Steve, we're not going to be able to do Alice as a, a, a bundled game. It was going to come right in the box with the Macintosh. I'm sorry, we're not going to be able to do that. And uh, the response is, oh, that's okay. It's all right. I, I don't mind. And Steve and J Jobs is then like, no, no, we're going to make it up to you. We're going to put it in a really nice box. <laughs> and so he's like, oh, you don't have to do that. No, we're going to do this. We're going to put it in a nice box for you. And he really didn't mind that much because he'd, he'd been paid a bit of extra money for this on top of his Apple salary. And again, it was just something he made for his friends. But Jobs, of course, follows through on his promise to put it in a nice box. And he tells the, the relevant people, uh, the, the, the department that does this stuff, I want you to like, spare no expense, buy a, all the fancy materials, do a beautiful box for this game. And so they designed it to look like a book because, of course, Alice Through the Looking Glass is a, an old book, a, a very cool book. Great collector's item, I bet. Uh, it's worth a lot of money. Uh, it is worth a lot of money. And so Steve Capps uh, gets to design the packaging himself. He, he does the illustration that's on the cover. He puts in a whole lot of Easter eggs. Uh, there's like some dedication to, to a girlfriend he had at the time, to his favorite band, all these little things that if you look closely, you might find. Dead Kennedy. And they, yeah, Dead Kennedy's in there. And they they pop it in the box, and then when the Macintosh comes out, they put that in the store as well. That's not that's a product that you can buy. So the first Macintosh game was actually published by Apple. That's the only commercial game that Apple ever published. And that's of course, the game is so difficult that it's not going to get much buzz because everyone who buys it is then trying to figure out, well, how do I actually play this thing? And Apple has made a point of distancing the Mac from games. So no one really even knows that games are a thing that you can do on the Mac. And as a result, it sells really badly. And ironically, they end up giving it away with the machine in some stores it's just so they can get rid of the stock. I mean, they got this sort of dream machine. I remember you got Graham, uh... Uh, divine of, of the seventh guest of doing the i guess the way you call that the intro or prologue or the whatever forward four mm -hmm. there we go he's <laughs> like yeah. this is a dream machine all this it just ignites everybody's creativity they're doing all these wonderful uh, games and basically nobody outside of this tiny little little group of insiders knows anything about uh, you know it makes you wonder like and <laughs> you know, what if they hadn't done this what if they just said you know the heck with being serious we're just going to go ahead with this and really uh, emphasize the game, the gaming potential of this machine. You think we'd be telling a very different story here today? Maybe. It, it's impossible to know for sure. I mean, the the black and white graphics, while they were beautiful and evocative, they were also a, a big challenge because game developers, they were at the time used to working in eight colors or 16 colors and very soon after in much more than that with the Amiga, but they were working in, in color in resolutions that were much smaller than the Macintosh. So the Mac had a 512 by 342 pixels and your typical computer of the era had 300 by 200 or even less. The Apple II's high res mode was just slightly less than that, I believe. And, and the low res mode was like another half of, of that. So you had resolutions that were half or less of the size of the Macintosh screen. So there's a lot more pixels you got to draw. You really couldn't do any and, serious desktop publishing on those. Mm. With the, you need the resolution like this to do the serious. So desktop publishing work. Yeah. And so the challenge then I think for game developers, and, and this was something that was an issue uh, very much as the machine came out and 
you know the the reality we did get rather than the the fantasy that that we might have had was that they had to basically make an entirely new game for the Macintosh mm. the they had to they had to deal with having a mouse when on other systems they probably wouldn't they had to deal with having these pull down menus at the top of the screen and most games they didn't have that unless they actually made it themselves as a custom bit of code they had to do these much higher resolution graphics that were black and white instead of color they had to follow all these different design language uh, elements in order to make something for the mac and the audience for the mac was very fickle about this if you didn't make things in the mac way they noticed and they didn't buy your software as a result oh. so that's a lot of work that you had to put in and this is back in the days when you had half a dozen different computer platforms that most games would come out for and they do these quick and dirty ports exactly so yeah. without a big installed base it would have struggled to be a big gaming platform regardless i think i wanted to take a look at some of these mac adventure games because those are some of the ones that i played on the uh on the amiga let's see if i can pull one up here i'm trying to find a picture that shows you like using the uh, the interface because hmm. i remember that was one of the things i liked about about this series on yeah, here we go uh, one of the things I liked about this series on the Amiga is one of the few games that did use the workbench <laughs> style interface. Mm. And I guess that was, you know, they must have been thinking, uh, you know, let's take the, what we like about this uh, version that they did on the, the Macintosh originally and make a more fitting, <laughs> even though it's a port, <laughs> you know, in some ways it's more, it, it's more uh, Amiga-like than a lot of the other games, right? They just bypass uh, the workbench altogether. Uh, but yeah, here's Deja Vu 2 looks like, and this is using, you know, if you never played these, these are really, I, I love this interface so much because it's almost like you're not really leaving that world of the desktop. Mm. You know, when you play it, it it's an extension, yeah. It's like, an, yeah extension an extension of the world of, that you were in. It's just so cool that it doesn't, like almost every other game, you know, you play it just bypasses it in your in this own thing. So I'm kind of uh, impressed that they really kind of almost. Let's look at a manhole too. Manhole's beautiful. I love it. Yeah, so for people who don't know, that was the first game by Cyan, who later did Mist. Yeah, there's a. Video. And this has this has a lovely story behind it itself, where. Uh, um, Rand Miller was a programmer working at a bank and he was, he loved his Macintosh and his brother, Robin, uh, several years younger was a, a student. Uh, and when HyperCard came out in 1987, uh, HyperCard being this almost a precursor to the web, uh, in how it worked, um, this hypertext and hypermedia, um, authoring tool. Rand was really enamored by it. He thought this is just the coolest thing. And he thought, hey, maybe we can make a children's interactive book with this. And so he got in touch with his younger brother and, and said, hey, you want to illustrate a book for me? And so then he sent Robin a copy of Hypercard and Robin had a Macintosh as well. Uh, he and his young wife, uh, no, sorry, Rand had the young wife. R Robin um, had a Macintosh in his parents' basement. So he was still close enough to home that he could go back back to the parents and, and play with their Macintosh at home. And so he plugged, popped in HyperCard and was just looking at the blank screen, the, the authoring tool of HyperCard. Its paint tool was basically Mac Paint, uh, but integrated into the program. And he just wondered, well, what do I do now? What shall I draw? And it just sort of invited him to ponder. And he, on a whim, decided, let's draw a manhole cover. And then he was thinking, well, what's going to be on the next page? 
because it's a children's book, you're going to have multiple, you know, different drawing on each page. And he says, well, what, let's open the cover. And so he draws another image where he opens the cover and then he's got this hole in the ground and he thinks, well, what should we do there? Let's have a beanstalk grow out of it. But then suddenly paths have diverged. He's got a beanstalk that goes up and he wants to go up, but he also wants to see where it came from, he wants to go down. Hmm. And this is the magic of hypercard because it's all this clickable interface. So you build these hotspots that you click on something and then you uh, can interact with that. So here you've got like these cards on the there for buttons and things. It's much the same way you can draw an illustration and then you set your hotspot as the top half of the screen, say then you'll go up bottom half of the screen you'll go down and so he he draws these diverging paths different images and forgets all about the whole children's book thing he just gets drawn into an interactive world and he he builds the whole thing stream of consciousness just keeps getting drawn to what's next what's around this corner what's through this door every time he draws a new image he he uh, is inspired to wonder what's next. And that really is sort of the DNA of mist. It was let's where we're exploring this possibility space and we're ever being drawn onward in multiple different directions. Yeah, I can definitely see a lot of mist. In this, this is game. cute. I mean, this artwork too is just fantastic. Hey, baby, welcome <laughs> to my cool pad. <laughs> okay, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> and if you if you have the sound on, he actually uh, says that as well. Yeah, this hypercard is a great example too of just the how easy it is for people that aren't necessarily technical, you know, super advanced programmers just to jump in and just start creating something that you can complete and actually make money. Yeah, very much so. And it's not a lot of money, but <laughs> so Graham Devine saw this, right? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, Mist was made in Hypercard and it wound up making a lot of money. So it was possible, but uh, you had to be pretty lucky. <laughs> I think that was probably the only Hypercard program that ever made a lot of money. Yeah, you know, I hear people would knock it for that. You know, maybe even back in the day, some of their viewers would be like, well, this is really just, a, you know, a slideshow or, you know, trying to dismiss, just totally missing the whole appeal of the game, I thought. Is there a black and white version of that? Like for the... Of Mist? No. Uh, I think so it was Mist, always... was, Mist was 1993. And so the world had moved way beyond black and white by that point. Now, Hypercard never actually properly supported color. So they had to use these plugins that were built for it. So these third party plugins, um, uh, X commands, I think the, the name is off the top of my head. It's been a while. And so they actually used quite a lot of these plugin things, um, to make mist. And so that's why it's a lot more sophisticated than a typical Hypercard program was. Uh, and yeah, and they, they did uh, the graphics in various other third-party programs. Back at the very beginning, uh, Robin was working in some 3D software and he very quickly realized there's no way I can make the game like this. So he had to change tools. I think he ended up using Photoshop for a lot of it. Yeah, I missed. I love those games. Yeah, they're just looking at some pictures of Robin and, <laughs> and Rand. And so let's see, we've talked about Manhole. Uh, we haven't really talked about, or I guess, yeah, missed him. We haven't really talked about SimCity yet. Mm. That's one of my favorites. Let's see if I can pull that up from your... I had it a second ago from your... Oh, maybe I don't have it pulled up. But anyway, <laughs> what's the... Where does uh, SimCity enter the picture here? So SimCity, SimCity's roots are not on the Mac. 
right. uh, it was it was initially a Commodore 64 program by Will Wright. Um, yeah, that Commodore 64 version. <laughs> that is probably not what comes to the mind when people think about this. No, go ahead. No, not at all. Not at all. Uh, and and the Commodore 64 game grew out of his previous game, Raid on Bungling Bay, where he built these editing tools and he kept playing with the editing tools after the game had come out and eventually realized with the help of his city planner neighbor that he was building a city planning game. And uh, so he, he kept working on that. He he had a publishing deal for a little while with Bruderbund and uh, they scrapped the deal when he refused to make it more of a game. They They were confused. They thought this software toy element is weird why is there no victory condition mm -hmm. that they couldn't they couldn't grok it it just it didn't make sense to them so they cancelled it and then he was all demoralized and a while later he met jeff braun at a party and uh, then they he later gave a demo of the game and jeff was just blown away by it this is going to be huge and i'm going to help you make this i'm going to start a company up so that we can sell this game and and i'm going to surround you with talented people for whatever things we need and so they went and they hired someone to do the to do new graphics and do the interface and they made the macintosh the lead platform and that's where they they took these ideas of uh, the tool palette that had been very uh badly done um, very very rough effort yeah. on the commodore 64 that was inspired by um by pinball construction set oh, yeah. which had itself uh, been drawn from the the work they'd done at xerox park on the the alto so all these things all these roads connecting back to the to xerox uh so this crew, this little team at, at Maxis, they refashioned the game that would become SimCity into this thing that was sort of like Mac Paint, mm. but you were making a city and it was alive. It would come alive because it was also a simulation. It wasn't just something that you draw out with the tools that uh, uh, remarkably like a Mac Paint tool palette. You click on your your residential tool and then you you paint these squares on the screen. You you click on your road tool, you draw out your road. You're basically just painting your city down. I've and then it comes alive. That connection, but yes. <laughs> yes, it's like if you can use make Mac Paint, you can play this game. And the whole thing comes alive. Um and and there's some fascinating simulation ideas behind that uh, that uh, are really well explored in a book that'll be out like in a year's time or something by uh, Kai McGingold, who uh, worked with Will Wright on Spore. Uh, but that's that's a long way out uh, before he'll have that out. And there's all these quirky little things in the game, like if you uh, build a power plant, you own, you you connect it to your city power grid, but then when you get to the point where you need another power plant because you, you don't have enough power to supply everyone, you can actually build that second one anywhere. It doesn't need to be hooked up to the grid because the simulation isn't sophisticated enough to actually integrate these different elements. I get it. <laughs> so the, no, that's a that's a funny thing, but they could get away with that because. The game looked and and felt like it was a city. So people would make assumptions about, well, how do cities work? Or well, cities work where roads connect to everything. And it turns out in the game, you don't actually have to because when it's checking for the, the routes that people can follow, it doesn't actually follow the road in its entirety to see that that road can connect to everything else. It just goes, is there a road near the other zones? Great when it's checking do we have enough power to power all our buildings it just goes well is there a power plant hooked up yep great 
the total power that our city generates is enough for what we need. And we're hooked up to one of these power plants. This is a talk about addictive. But I, I spent so much time with SimCity and SimCity 2000 after it, uh, beautiful you, games. I mean, look how similar that is. Yeah. The they just they here. stole the whole interface. Yeah, it's great. I don't know why. <laughs> it's <just laughs> so obvious now, but <laughs> wow. And yeah, so, so SimCity kind of became game. this. I mean, yeah, I just called it Mac Paint. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, so much. Uh, it's a paint program, but look, I mean, it inspired so many things. Mm. And I think SimCity was the vehicle by which the ideas of Mac Paint sort of came out to the world because SimCity was ported to these other platforms and it was a tremendously big success and uh, a very mainstream success. It was one of the first mainstream success, success stories in games. And so that is a bit of why we ended up having these interfaces in other games. Uh, I, I think it was, was less people being inspired by the Macintosh and probably more people being inspired by SimCity. Well, let's see. We have talked about a lot of stuff here. <laughs> mm. Trying to think, what are we? We're missing something, though. We've got HyperCard, Mac Paint. Oh, there's something here that you were telling me about Spaceship Warlock. <laughs> there's a fun story there. Uh, so that was an early adventure game. Uh, 1991 it came out um and the idea was like let's do kind of an interactive movie and and this became a big thing in the 90s let's do interactive oh, I movies i love that. but these guys <laughs> these guys wanted to do it with 3d rendered graphics so they weren't hiring actors or anything uh, and they're just two people uh, mike signs and joe sparks and they live on opposite sides of America. The one's in Chicago and the other one is, um, some, somewhere in Southern California. Uh, and so they're, they're very, very far away. They're a couple of thousand miles away from each other and they're trying to build a CD-ROM game. In 1990, they're working on this. CD-ROMs are almost unheard of at the time. The first CD-ROM programs had only come out a couple of years before and a, a CD burner is still tens of thousands of dollars and a, a CD-ROM player is really rare and it's not built into any consumer computers, not even any of the Macintoshes yet. It's still a couple of years before the first Mac with a built-in CD drive comes out. But these guys, you know, they're they're dedicated to, to doing this cool idea. And they think, well, somehow it's going to work out. This is the future. We'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll figure it out. <laughs> so they, they start making this thing, but remember they're a couple of thousand miles apart and they're trying to build a CD-ROM game. And this is 1990. And so you didn't have cable internet yet. You, you didn't have all these file sharing services like Dropbox and, and things. You didn't have video conferencing uh, apps that you could use. You basically just had phone and fax and sending letters to each other and packages through the mail. And CD-ROMs, they've got a capacity of about 600 megabytes. So they're making a, a game that could potentially have up to 600 megabytes of storage, but the hard drive on their computers is 80 megabytes built in hard drive floppy disks megabytes, not gigabytes <laughs> megabytes yeah megabytes <laughs> floppy disks are like 1.4 megabytes or less depending on what kind of disk disk you're getting uh, a lot of 800k disks still around at the time and so they need to actually share these files because one of them is doing the, the graphics and the 3D rendering and the other one's writing the code and they need to th send things back and forth so that they can hook it all up to the game. And as a result, uh, one of them, Joe Sparks, buys an external hard drive 
He spends hundreds of dollars on this external hard drive, and it's a whopping 120 megabytes, 40 wow. megabytes bigger than the one built into his computer. And like less than a quarter of the capacity of a CD-ROM. And they decide we're going to put, we're going to make this the capacity of the game because we, we need everything to fit onto a single drive so that later on we can give it to the, the production plant so they can press the CDs. And so they literally ship this hard drive back and forth across the country. So Joe will, will work all day really hard on some new 3D rendered uh, scene. And then he'll just before five o'clock rush off to the uh, the FedEx delivery cent F FedEx center and and overnight it to Mike Sines in Chicago, so that then the next day he's not going to be twiddling his thumbs with nothing to do. So the next day he'll be able to keep programming the game, and then Mike will work on it and he'll overnight it back to to Joe. And they keep sending this hard drive back and forth across the country. Jeez. It's their only copy of the entire game. Of course, they've got backups of individual components on on like a gazillion floppy disks but this is the only copy of the entire game and they're shipping it back and forth across america multiple times a week <laughs> you can just imagine so many things could have gone wrong yeah, people these <laughs> days get upset about a wonky zoom call i mean imagine dealing with that and meanwhile, they, they get on the phone every night and talk about things. They send each other faxes with sketches and ideas. Faxes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, faxes. And occasionally they'll transfer some little tiny file, maybe like 100 kilobytes or something, over AOL. Because you wouldn't want to send anything large because it would take days to send something that's multiple megabytes. Days. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And after about four months, somehow, they've got the game almost finished and they take it to Macworld and show it off and, and uh, they're bemused that people are all excited about the thing that Joe had done to hide a mistake he made, where he'd drawn, <laughs> right at the beginning of the game, he'd drawn a door on one of the, the buildings uh, and there, there wasn't meant to be a door there. But this is the beginning of the game. So it's very important that you set expectations that when people click on something that looks interactive, mm -hmm. that they actually can interact with it. So if someone sees this door and they click on it and nothing happens, he knows that they might never click on another door in the game and they might get very stymied very quickly. So he quickly uh, puts together, hacks together this, this little animation of an alien, it's the, the game is about uh, alien pirate, like space pirates. Uh, an alien will pop his head around the corner and go, use the front door, <laughs> and then disappear again. And all through, all through the, the weekend, that's what the Macworld Expo, people playing the game, they just start giggling when they see that, and it makes the whole experience for them. I'm trying to see if I can find that little moment. So it's right at the start of the game. Yeah. This might be a demo. I'm mean, just looking at this. I mean, the graphics are really nice. Well, this is... So you've got an elaborate intro here uh, that they, they were inspired by uh, Star Wars and Blade Runner. Uh, they, they even had like a sort of a fly through Blade Runner in style. Quite an elaborate story. It's fun to think about them mailing that hard drive back and forth. But yeah, I think it's uh is it it's right near here. Um a bit after this. Uh yeah it's it's just coming up uh if you Want to skip it forward or show a bit of this? These guys are, are very fun to look at. Love this graphical style. Yeah. So, so it was very, it's they were of... very conscious of the fact that when they're building this, they had to make sure that 
everything that looked clickable would be clickable, that something would happen. Looks kind of like missed the way that it's controlled. Hmm. Oh, <laughs> yeah, so I, I'm not sure if we've, if we've gone past it, if it's the very first screen or it's coming up, but uh, well, it was a very fun moment. <laughs> we can let people find it. <laughs> yeah. Spaceship Warlock. Yeah, it had this great theme song, the Spaceship Warlock. <laughs> Joe Sparks is a musician, and uh, he he just went uh, all in on on the silly the silly music for the, for the game. I almost feel like I mean, I guess that's what the whole book is. You know, the joy of the book is there's all these undiscovered or under you know stuff you probably had no idea was going on. You know, it's just so cool. The secret world of Mac gaming. Yeah, and and we haven't really we haven't even talked about how uh, you had this shareware scene in the '90s that was often it's off siloed from the whole PC world that, that they were a world unto themselves. The, these Mac people, they were they were making games that, uh, in most cases, never came out on PC and some of these games were, were beautiful experiences. Uh, I'm I'm personally a huge fan of the glider games, which uh, uh, you fly a paper airplane through a house, uh, very charming puzzle adventure things. Glider. And Ambrosia software were like, they were the, to the Mac what Apogee was to, to the PC. They were a huge deal in, in shareware. And uh, the fun story there is that they were founded be because uh, Andrew Welch, the founder, uh, thought someone was wrong on the internet and he had to prove them wrong. So he actually made a game to prove them wrong about uh, a particular Macintosh model not being capable of doing smooth animation. <laughs> and then it turns out the game he made yeah. called Maelstrom was actually really good. So he made a bunch of money from it and he decided to after much agonizing, he decided he'd, he'd start a company and he began recruiting people off the internet to make games that he published and all their games were sort of inspired by arcade classics for the most part, um, but almost remixing them. Mm -hmm. And uh, they became the darlings of the Macintosh world, that they were so popular, so beloved. And there were these other co entire companies that, that built up uh, that were on the Mac, really well known. Outside the Mac, almost unheard of. And Bungie actually was one of those. Yeah, it was Hill Halo. Bungie. Yeah, what, what's the story with Bungie and the Macintosh? So uh, Bungie started out with Alex Seropian, who was a student at the University of Chicago. Uh, he'd made this weird little uh, war game like thing. Uh, it's basically a tank shooter uh, called Operation Desert Storm. And he decided that he would uh, put it out under the name Bungie Software. Uh, basically self published the thing. Uh, this is 1991. Sold, a, I think, 2,000 copies. I, I had one of these copies for a while. I gave it, mm. sold it on to a collector. Um, oh. It was not a good game. It, it really was. It, <laughs> Operation Desert Storm. Yeah, it, it was It was really not a very good game. But uh, he, he got really into it. He, he took inspiration from the real world Operation Desert Storm and Take a look at and it. it's a pretty difficult game. And then he he met another student around this time called Jason Jones. And Jason Jones was also into Mac game development. Yeah, you see it's very primitive <laughs> style here. Quite challenging too. Yeah. You would not think this was this was the beginning of Bungie, yeah. <laughs> Whoa, that's almost... 
And so Jason Jones was a bit more accomplished as a programmer. I play combat on the Atari 2600. Yeah, just a bit nicer graphics and you know, high resolution. So they were able to, he was able to make these mazes and stuff. And Jason Jones had, had made a, um, it was kind of a, a, a multiplayer uh, RPG inspired uh, combat game. Um, so you you have these characters, you're sort of in a maze, you're chasing each other around a maze, trying to kill each other. Um, Top-down view, That's but, starting to uh, sound side like on sprites. <laughs> mm. That's starting to sound like Halo. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a bit more familiar. And so they, they, they decide to become 50-50 partners in Bungie, and they put that game out a few months after Operation Desert Storm, and it also sells a couple of thousand copies. And then they, they see Wolfenstein 3D and they get really excited by it. And they think we could make something like this because Jason Jones is actually a very good programmer. We, we could do something like this and they figure out how it works and they come up with uh, a bunch of different ideas for how they would do it. And they wind up settling on this story of a, uh, a special forces operative uh, whose team has has just died when they're trying to visit uh, a Mayan pyramid. Uh, there's rumors that beneath this pyramid, deep, deep beneath this pyramid, there's some sort of super weapon. Uh, and the Nazis had come in search of it, uh, what, 60 years earlier, uh, and failed. And so you're assigned with your unit to go in and, and find this weapon, whatever this godlike weapon is. But then you get there and everyone has died except for you. Pretty typical setup. You're, you're alone in this place and there are bodies on the ground uh, of your comrades, your fallen comrades, and so you can loot their corpses. But there are also these long dead Nazis. <laughs> so... Nazis who died like 60 years earlier, their bodies are still on the ground. And mm. you, you go into this world and it looks sort of like Wolfenstein 3D, but uh, a little bit of a different style. Um, they're very quirky monster designs and uh, it's very dark. Uh, the ceiling and the floor is, is black. Um, you're, you're underneath this pyramid. So of course it's, it's got a dark mood. And lots of sort of jump scare moments as you're exploring around and, and shooting people or shooting monsters, sorry. Um, the interface, uh, if you can pull a screenshot of this up, what's the, the interface is very weird. What's Pathways it? into darkness. What's it? One more time. Pathways, Pathways into darkness. Into darkness. Yeah, it should probably show an image here if you can find one of the original screen uh it had a a main viewing yeah screen and then multiple windows oh so cool yeah i haven't seen it, this it before it's very awkward interface but fascinating idea to have these multiple windows and yeah you know, some text prompts come up when you uh, come across some interactive objects you can pull up a map everything is is using the language of the macintosh uh, it's, it's a very creepy game, as you can see. see and eventually, eventually of... you can, oh, he's going to get attacked shortly, I think, unless he's already done all this. Eventually you'll get this uh, crystal that allows you to speak to the dead people that you are coming across. And you can have these very That's basic right. conversations with them. What the? Uh, where <laughs> essentially you type in a keyword. And uh, they will then um, say some stuff. And so the Germans, the, their memories are so hazy because they've been dead for 60 years. They can't tell you much, but they can tell you a little bit about why they're there and what happened. You start building this suspense that uh, there's something really scary at the bottom of this dungeon. 
<laughs> and you keep coming across these weird monsters. I wonder if Carmack there's, and Romero played this. There's this there's these skeleton dudes that throw bones at you. Uh some of the monsters are, are fast moving, you know, different classes of monsters as as is the norm. Some have this projectiles. Looks like a lot of fun, actually. It is. It, it's probably my favorite first person shooter game. And uh it's, it's very much a hybrid of first person shooter and adventure. There's a, there's a lot of adventure element. As you can see, you've got uh, these messages giving a, a really simple basic story. You've got your inventory who like inspired by an RPG, almost some of this interface. Yeah, it's looking like weapon proficiencies. And... Yeah. It is kind of ominous. Hmm. And so Pathways into Darkness sold really well. Oh, it's got an uh, inventory it, too. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Huh. <laughs> and this has got nested happen. inventory as well, like uh, the Mac Venture games, which we didn't we didn't talk about how they 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 went a step further than your, your typical like Lucas Arts adventure, which came after uh, the Mac Venture games, you had the the nested inventory. So you you get your jacket in the first deja vu, and then you can double click on your jacket, and there's stuff inside your jacket. One of those things is a wallet. You double click on your wallet, and there's stuff inside your wallet. And each time you do that, another window opens. So you had the nested inventory. I love Deja Vu. I loved all those games. Uninvited. That was a scary one. Mm. Yeah. This is... Uninvited and Shadowgate both have these horrible jump scare moments where the game is so silent. You've yeah. been playing for like two hours and then suddenly this horrible sound comes up. Yeah. Oh my. The Uninvited game was so creepy. I think it would pretty hold up even today, really. Yeah, this one was. I was never able to beat this game. I wonder if he's going to open up the jacket because I remember there's like a wallet in there. And... Yeah. You can even uh, open. Oh, there up he goes. Yeah, open that, and you've yeah. got stuff inside. Yeah, and this. I forgot about. It. Yeah, yeah, the windows pop, pop open. Mm. Yeah, and you, and you don't actually have to click on the, the open button every time there. You can double click, I guess, showing for effect uh, that these verbs do these things. And you, know, the, you can click and drag. You know, it's using all of the metaphors of the desktop that they really wanted you to be able to do everything that you could do on your desktop in yeah, the I game. Just, I, I love games. Like, I wish more games were like this. You know, why recreate, why reinvent the wheel every time? Mm. Yeah, this is a, it's like we're looking at Doom Master 1994's video. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he watches this show. <laughs> well, that is, uh, it's been so much fun talking to you, Richard. I mean, my goodness. Let's go back to the page here where we can look at the, look at the book. The Secret History of Mac Gaming Expanded Edition coming soon. How soon is soon? <laughs> well, available from the 29th, unless unless there's a, a delay. Uh, you got to ship that hard my... back and forth a few times. Right? <laughs> uh, the the publisher Sam Sam at Bitmap just a couple of days ago, as we're talking now, a couple of days ago uh he got his advanced copy so uh i've seen a picture of it it's it's real it's been printed and uh it'll be available very soon you're looking at the sewn binding and you see oh, a lot of games oh. are mentioned in this thing <laughs> now every chapter every for Is every yeah. macintosh game <laughs> not every game there, there, are, there are many many more games uh, i'm actually uh, slowly working on a second volume that Mac will Jesus. what is Mac Jesus <laughs> it's very weird uh if if you do a search for it uh you you you'll be able to to, to, to see but uh in essence it's um 
a very sacrilegious uh, interactive version of Jesus who uh, can give you advice uh, in the form of televangelist advice. Uh, so it's, it's not good advice, you know, it's, <laughs> and uh, you can, you can do horrible things to him, like stab him in the eye with, uh, <laughs> Yeah, you can really stab him in the eye with a nail. Was that a commercial release? It was shareware, uh, and there's a there was a second version of it. Uh, <laughs> but the, version. <laughs> yeah, uh, like a, a better version, uh, still very very rough and very uh, controversial in its, its style. But the the original, the full title is Mac Jesus, your personal savior on a floppy disk. And it, it's weird. On that right now. <laughs> that is Shanghai's on there too. Shufflepuck. I used to play Shufflepuck Cafe in, in Shanghai. Yeah, they're, they're both uh, wonderful games. I, I love Dreamy them. Dreamy Man Project. Yeah, those are. Were those exclusive to the Mac, the Dreamy Man mm. Projects? No, I, I believe they were Mac and Windows. Um, they were made in. Uh, in uh what's it called a uh, macro minds thing macromedia uh... oh uh talking about it's not flash uh, director or something yeah yeah they were, they were made in like the earliest version of director i think from memory um it's been a while since i i wrote that chapter <laughs> you'd mentioned one called snood i think this is yes. new to this edition yes yeah, snood is new to to this edition and um, for those who don't know, Snood is uh, a shareware version of uh, Puzzle Bobble or um, Buster Move, uh, a lot of viewers will know it as, uh, except very cleverly, the developer, Dave Dobson, ripped out the time limits. So where you have on each turn when you're deciding uh, where to shoot those bubbles to do the, the match three thing, um, in what amounts to a reverse Tetris. Uh, in the original arcade game, you had limited time to do that because of course they want you to lose so that you'll then put in more money. But he was trying to make something that his wife could enjoy and she loved more uh, ponderous games. She liked things that were slower, more strategic. And so he ripped out that time limit. And now suddenly anyone could play this thing, no matter what their proficiency is with, with a mouse, no matter how quickly they could think. They could spend days deciding on their next move if they wanted. There's they could play it uh, at the office in, in their, their little moments between uh, meetings or something. So you could hop in and out of it very quickly, very easily. And on top of that, to make it even more accessible, he had made every one of those little snoods the bubbles essentially uh be unique uh, so oh really each each different type each different color is not only a different color but it's a different shape and it has different uh facial expressions to the others mm -hmm. so they're actually all unique oh. Oh. you see there the the green class there they're a square oh. the the blue is is a circle so each one is a different shape, it makes it much more accessible. And Snood, for those who don't know, is phenomenally popular. It had millions of users. It, uh, as a Mac game, it, it was like, got into the thousands of users um, and about a thousand registrations before Dave Dobson did a PC version in 99. And that just spread around the world. And uh, oh, several years later, it had more than 5 million downloads. It was uh, regarded as one of the most popular computer games in the world. Holy cow, look at all these versions he's got now. Yeah, and so he he sold it on to other people, so he doesn't, he's out of it now. He, he He's a professor at a university like you, uh, but Should have stuck this, this is his creation. <laughs> I haven't ever played this game. I really want to now. It, so it's a lot of fun. So that was, you didn't even mention that before. Now it's in the expanded edition. Yeah. 
Yeah, so folks, I don't know. I think, <laughs> you know, can you pre-order it or how do we? No, unfortunately, oh you can't. Uh, oh, Richard. But very soon you can you can sign up for the, that email <laughs> thing. this thing pre-ordered. <laughs> Are you going to sign a copy for me? How do I make I'd, it? I'd be happy to if we can ever uh, oh. get get to each other in person. There's a long distance between us, you know, me being in Melbourne, Australia. Oh, that's not that far. <laughs> yeah, there's that paper airplane game. Hmm. Well, folks, there do we is there anything else that you wanted to mention about this? Oh. You know, this this publisher, they do such a great job. Yeah, bit bitmap's been delightful to work with. Uh, they actually contacted me at just the right time, very conveniently. Uh, I just uh the book had gone out of print a few months earlier and I was I was working on getting the the rights back uh, so that I could make it available again. And right around that time, I got an email from Sam saying, hey, you want to do a new version of this with me? And so that was just perfect. So once I got, once I officially got the rights back, I, I worked with him on coming up with uh, some ideas for how to make it a bit more special. Uh, we made sure to, to revise the design based on some feedback. Some people really disliked in the original version that the text margins were much closer to the edge of the page. Uh, people were quite upset by that. <laughs> got some <laughs> got some nasty messages about how much people disliked it. So it's very divisive, it turned out. And and Sam uh that test drive? Uh, yeah, cool. yeah, yeah, test oh, drive. Nice. And and on the other page there, Mac Golf was a really popular game. Oh. I have a, I have an elaborate story about Mac Golf's development, but it's not in here. Uh, I've got it since then. Uh, it'll be going in volume two when I eventually do that. That's yeah, Glider as well. That's the original shareware version of Glider. The paper's I was on Amazon game. a while ago, I was trying to get a copy of this the original version, and I think it's there's only like one copy, and they want uh, probably a lot of money. Oh yeah, look at this. hundred dollars one new three hundred dollars <laughs> yeah please don't if, if you're watching this please don't spend that money <laughs> wait that. wait a week <laughs> wait wait a little bit of time and get the version from bitmap it's it's a better book there's more in it uh we've, we've polished it a bit and it won't cost you a hundred dollars <laughs> it'll cost you like thirty forty dollars so you've also let's uh, wrap it up, but I want you to. Uh, you mentioned you have some other stuff going on besides the books. You've got a podcast. I do. Um, and another, I make, I've have been to... sort of winding it down because I don't have time to work on it uh, like I did before. But I have this documentary style podcast about games history, uh, sort of inspired by. Um, by snap judgment and 99 percent invisible and this american life but mm. it's about video game history uh, so i just recently did a story on moby games uh i've got one that is at the bottom of the screen there on uh, chris crawford's dragon speech uh, that's my favorite episode of the show uh, Crawford. well i got to talk to chris about his famous speech from the the 1992 game developers conference where he charged out of the room holding a sword and uh, chasing a, a uh, an imaginary dragon. That's why it became known as the dragon speech, but it was originally called I Had a Dream. And it was kind of this sad speech that he gave, a, a brilliant lecture, the greatest lecture he ever gave, about how disillusioned he'd become with the games industry mm. and why. And how he thought games could be so much more games games were a medium of art but instead what he was seeing was for the most part people just making the same game over and over again with better graphics better sound some other new little feature people weren't pushing the envelope of what games could be and 
after much soul searching, he decided that the problem was him. And so he had to leave. And then he, he had this metaphor of himself as Don Quixote, oh. the, uh, <laughs> the fictional character who, who saw windmills, he, who, who, who saw magic in windmills, uh, others saw sheep. And he's like, no, this is a great windmill. Uh, we, we, he, he, he chased an imaginary world that could be better, Don Quixote. And Chris Crawford thought, I can do the same thing for games. And so the problem is me, the games industry is not going to fix itself. I need to step away from this and go pursue my dream on my own, away from these people. And so then that's why he spent, uh, what are we at now? Nearly 30 years. He's been chasing the dream of interactive storytelling, truly interactive storytelling where uh, uh, basically anything is possible but the problem being that uh, to come up with a story that's dramatically satisfying and truly interactive is an extremely difficult task and he's largely worked on it alone so uh, he probably won't achieve it he's now 70 70 years old i think You've sold me on your podcast episode. What episode <laughs> is this number? What number is that one? Can you? Oh, it's number thirty. Number thirty. There you go. Oh, okay. So yeah, it's a check that out. It's a great story, uh, and that's that's my favorite story I've ever done on the podcast, and one of my favorites that I've told just period across my career of uh, more than ten years writing about games. It's one of my favorite stories. So. And if, if uh, you've never seen the, the lecture, uh, I would recommend after you listen to the podcast, going through the whole thing on YouTube. It's, it's brilliant and it's so inspiring. And then we have another Terror book. Heroes. <laughs> so this is why you don't have time for your podcast. Huh? Yeah, I have another book coming out next year. Uh, the book is done. Uh, we are, I, I'm at the moment reviewing the copy edited manuscript. <laughs> oh, there we go. That's, uh, that's the wrong trailer. <laughs> the wrong trailer. That's the Mac gaming trailer. <laughs> that's funny. I didn't know they they'd messed up there. Uh, <laughs> that, that, that's the trailer for the secret history of Mac gaming. I was like, hmm. Mist was not a shareware game. <laughs> <laughs> is this Bitmap again doing this one? No, this is with Unbound. Unbound. Um, yeah. Looks and so uh, Unbound was the original publisher of Secret History Mac Gaming as well. And uh, this is essentially a book about indie game development before it was called indie. Mm -hmm. uh, it, 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 is picking up this it's focused on this shareware era um shareware for anyone who doesn't know I, most people watching this should know what shareware is but in case you don't it's basically a a voluntary payment system you you a developer push it put it puts out a product and says if you like it please send me ten dollars to register or to get yeah, they, some extra content. They tell you that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> this screen will, if you pay money, you won't have to look at the screen for two minutes. You talk about yeah. that aspect of it in here. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I, in this book, uh, tell the uh, history of shareware from its inception in uh, the early 1980s through to when it sort of faded into the background. It didn't, it never disappeared. It's still around but it yeah, stopped copies. it stopped being uh, the dominant modality of indie development in the early 2000s when um, things like PayPal was starting to build up and, and it was getting much easier to distribute something commercially without having a box. And, and that's when uh, the whole idea of indie games uh, emerged in the early 2000s. But before that, there were still indie games, they just weren't called indie. And this book is about them. 
Oh, so you talk about the Mac, but also. Yeah, various... it's multiple platforms. Uh, and of course, the PC, you know, the bulk of shareware was DOS games, <laughs> uh, Apogee and Epic. Now, this is, you know, I like the nostalgia, but you dig so much deeper and find these, these stories that nobody's heard before. That, that's uh, that's how I approach my my work. I, I don't like telling stories that have been told by others unless they didn't do a good job and I can do better, then maybe I'll, I'll tackle it. But I'm drawn to the stories that have have been missed, that, that are maybe significant, but they've been missed. And I think shareware heroes like Mac Gaming, uh, it's this overlooked but influential topic. The, the, I, I say in Shareway Heroes that in, in the conclusion that everything is shareware now. Like free to play is the dominant modality of games now. There's far more free to play on freemium uh, stuff, you know, games that you can buy. That you that you download free, and then you can buy add-on packs. You can you can buy some virtual currency for it, whatever it is. You you can spend thousands of dollars on a single game, but the game is free. And this all emerged out of shareware. And they they incorporated elements of arcade games and a coin op. Keep putting those coins in, so you can keep playing. That's but, almost come full circle, man. But it emerged out of shareware. The original idea of shareware was it was an experiment in economics, and and really weirdly, we we managed to go full circle, and we went from free to free with the asterisk of we'd like you to buy this. And that that is shareware, and then we went through this whole cycle of different versions of shareware into uh most things cost money uh, again and now we're back to free with the asterisk for the majority of games and other programs as well and even things like facebook is free with an asterisk and the asterisk is that they steal all your personal information and sell it to advertisers yeah that's a giant asterisk on that it looks like it's 45 dollars plus mm -hmm. shipping for the hardback it's not bad for a hardback signed book plate what in the world is a book plate that's basically the trick but that lets us give you a signed copy without me being able to go to unbound's office because they're in london and i'm in australia and so i will be signing um something that then gets like digitally put on to uh, these book plate things and so you you get my signature on the book but it's not uh hand drawn by me it's a copy of my signature well shareware hero so i will put the links to all of these things there for you viewers i think you're gonna that'll, that'll be out <laughs> you're gonna be spending some money here today i think yeah <laughs> you want to so, shareware yeah. heroes of course you want this book that we've been talking about here expanded edition Listen to the podcast. Uh, and if you want to spend even more money, uh, I'm, work <laughs> I, I'm, I'm working as producer on an upcoming documentary with uh, David L. Craddock, friend of the show. Oh, David Craddock. Uh, yeah. So uh, we're working on a film called First Person Shooter, which, of course, is about first person shooters. Uh, it's going to be three, four hours long. It's this epic thing that uh, was crowdfunded recently. And uh, we're, we're working with a really cool team to uh, celebrate this this genre and everything that people loved about it uh, with like 50 interviews with different game developers. So they talk us through their stuff um, oh, and some journalists and things as well, but mostly game developers you get talking Romero. about... You got Romero in there, I know. Of course, of course, we've got Romero. We've got all the got original id founders. Did you get Carmack? So yeah, we got Carmack. Whoa, he doesn't we had, know. We had a great talk with Carmack. Mm. What is that? Is that out coming out soon? What? That's that's going to be out at the end of next year. That's a that's a long way away. <laughs> but you you can 
you can jump in on the crowdfunding anytime uh, Is that at the moment. Do you have a link it was that? Kickstarter and now it's on something called Crowdox. If you um, oh, first person shoot a documentary into Google, you'll probably come across it. I'm trying to find this thing. Uh, or actually, fpsdoc.com will redirect you to is this, is this the a, crowdfunding page. That's the one. <laughs> Three hundred ninety-nine percent funded. Yeah, I figured this would. You wouldn't have any problem selling that. Hmm. Now, let's see. This is like pounds or something. Or yeah, that's pounds. What is that in dollars? I wonder. The master. It's a bit more than that, I believe, in dollars. Ooh, the Doom Marine. Oh, you got all kinds of cool, like, merch and, like, add ons. Yeah. Wait, 14. Oh, somebody went, somebody sprang for that one. Oh, nobody mm -hmm. sprang for the 2800. Um, I think someone, someone might have on the Kickstarter. I, I don't know. Maybe not. Uh, but anyway, we. Oh, We're working this on this thing. It's really cool. We've got these amazing posters for it. Look That's that one of them poster. right there. Painted, uh, hand painted poster. Really oh, beautiful. God. Oh, I get it. You're the quick guy, <laughs> the Doom Marine. <laughs> well, the Master Chief, Duke Nukem's only 30. Your name in the credits. What do you have to do to get this poster? Uh, oh, the title. That's what. Do you get it at the Doom Marine or the Quake guy? So Craddock I don't and, remember. <laughs> you and Craddock teamed up on this. Yeah, well, we, we both got, well, I got recruited um, by the executive producer and then I straight away brought David in because yeah, he, you brought he knows this genre. Yeah, okay. he knows this genre better than me. Uh, he's, he's a genuine expert. I know shooters pretty well. I've written. I wrote an article for Ars Technica, which is how uh, the executive producer found me. I wrote this like 8,000 word history, but David's written the book on it. He, he wrote Rocket Jump. And oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and so I, you know I, I straight away said David should uh, be involved in this, at least as an advisor. And well, then he quickly went from advisor to producer to director. It's actually a well thought out poster here. Mm. Golden eye up there. I see a, the jolt cola. <laughs> yeah, this uh, when I th this it's was my good. idea. This poster when I saw the work of uh, the, the artist who did our our thing. He he does these sort of really nice posters of a bedroom setup. And I was well, what's the first person shooter setup going to be? Well, you you got the game on your computer and a whole bunch of big box things and, and you're in your bedroom and and then as a team we we figured out how to get all these little details in there some fun easter eggs sticker thing there he yeah. did a wonderful job on this it's so cool wow this thing is gonna be huge the ultimate oh, oh mouse pad <laughs> oh it's not just one t-shirt you've got Oh my God! <laughs> we may have to get you back on to talk about. Oh, you know, have to get you back on. Some of these folks I've had on this show: Sandy Graham. Yeah. The cast has changed slightly since then. A couple of people pulled out. We've got some new people in. Um, we're we're going to be talking to Rebecca Heinemann, who who you mm. know as well. Uh, she, she wasn't in the original cast, but. But we've got an interview coming up with her very soon. Um, and there's a few people that also that we're able to bring in to replace ones who've dropped out. Yeah, Scott, I was thinking about him. He's got a lot to say about shareware. Yeah, I, I, Scott Miller was super helpful with shareware heroes, of course, because he invented the dominant model of shareware, the, the Apogee model that was the that was the model that actually worked. And before that, shareware games, they were sort of a joke. You couldn't make money from it because why would someone pay for this thing that they've already enjoyed? Because the game was free. You play the game to find out if you like it. Oh, I've finished the game. Why should I give you money now? 
but Scott had this genius of idea. Well, I'm only going to give you part of the game. I'm going to give you the first chapter or the first episode of it, and then you got to pay to get the rest. It's just a little, you build his whole company on it, an epic. All yeah. Difference. Wow, this thing is, just looks amazing. Mm. Is there any way you don't have in this thing? Oh yeah, there's of course there's people we don't have, and we would have liked more actually, but we only have a budget for fifty interviews at the moment. Wow. Okay. Well, sign me up for this. All right. Well, thanks <laughs> for spending all this time with me, Rich. It's been fantastic. Well, you're doing some amazing stuff. Thank you. All right, folks. Well, we're going to stop it here. Let Richard get back to work. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again, and uh, just keep in touch. Yeah, this was fun. Uh, we, we should definitely do this again when the uh, Shareway Heroes comes out next year. Let's do it. And poo, that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Man, I had such a good time chatting with, uh, with Richard. You know, it's always good to get to talk to a fellow author. You know, you kind of got that kind of a kindred spirit, almost love of the history of this stuff, the uh, the stories that go untold. Uh, you know, without people like Richard, basically, and you know, if I, if I might include myself on in that list, <laughs> you know, authoring books like Dungeons and Desktops. Uh, I think if you like vintage games, you know, in my books, basically, I think you'll really like uh, Moss's book. So if you're still kind of on the fence, I think just go ahead and buy it. You know, uh, even if you don't know. Uh, you know, maybe not, don't know too much about Mac history, all the more reason uh, to get that. But uh, I think more importantly, you want to support these efforts because these are you know, good people. It's a good community. It's a community that you yourself are part of. Um, so along those lines, uh, <laughs> thank you uh, very, very, very much for making this show, this Mad Chat community possible. Could not, would not do this show without you. There's no way in heck... I would have 475 episodes worth of Mad Chat if it weren't for people like you stepping up to the plate and making it all possible. If you liked the episode, if it was worth uh, your time, it's worth a buck, I think. So please uh, put that buck into the old tip jar at the Patreon site, and you can keep Mad Chat in production. I want to get to episode 500. You know, I feel like it's, uh, you know, we're getting pretty close. You know, there's 25 more episodes. I know we can do it. Uh, so thank you for making that possible. All right, what about that news from the Met Cave? Oh ho ho! <laughs> well, first up, good old Punny on the Matt Chat Discord channel. Uh, wrote in about this, Disciples Liberation. Uh, this is a quote-unquote mature, dark fantasy strategy RPG with turn-based combat. I think they probably should have led with turn-based combat, because that's what... <laughs> that's my thing. Uh, anyway, uh, liberate the land of Nevendar and uncover the endless stories... Come back here. Come back here, Evernote. Where are you going with my... There we go. Let me try that again. I liberate the land of Nevendar and uncover the endless stories hidden within this richly detailed world where every decision has a consequence and every wrong move could be deadly. This came out on the 21st and it's on Steam now for about $40, $39.99. 80-plus hour campaign, four classes, lots of intricate turn-based combat. And this is from Frima, or maybe Frima, F-R-I-M-A studio out of Quebec. Canada. All right, next up, uh, this one really got me excited. Uh, this is Matt W., uh, the Haunted Chocolatier. Uh, this, this looks a little familiar. It's because it was uh, designed by the Stardew Valley creator, uh, Concerned Ape, and it looks to expand on the Stardew Valley formula with a more fantastical setting and a, quote, magical, <laughs> magical haunted ghost chocolate. Okay, uh, in this game you will play as a chocolatier living in a haunted castle. In order to thrive in your new role, you will have to gather rare ingredients, make delicious chocolates, and sell them in a chocolate shop. 
<laughs> uh, no release date set for that. Uh, but you got to give the guy credit. You know, uh, this this sounds a. Uh, I don't know if. Uh, are there other games where you play as a chocolatier? I don't know, but I love Stardew Valley so much. I'm definitely going to try this out. <laughs> you know, as soon as this comes out, I'm definitely going to play this. Uh, at least give it a try. All right, and then uh, lastly, this is it was on Indie Retro News, uh, and they're talking about a game called Briley Witch Chronicles. This is a game by ex Sega game developer and author Sarah Jane Avery. And she's doing this for the Commodore 64, uh, believe it or not. So this is a JRPG game for the Commodore 64. And we have a new tra uh, teaser trailer here showing you what the encounters look like. Mix potions in your very own cauldron, talk to people, watch cutscenes, <laughs> spend lots of time with your pet cat, and fight in a turn-based combat system. Briley Witch Chronicles. Uh, so go check that out. And you know, I'd love to get... Uh, you know, uh, Sarah Jane Avery, if you're watching this, get in touch with me. <laughs> you think, I think you'd be a great guest for, the, for Mad Chat. Uh, so if my, if my nose hurt, you know, pass that on. Uh, all right, let's wrap this up with a quote. And I was, uh, you know, of course, looking at quotes by certain Apple personalities, and I came across this one. I, I just think this is such a great quote. <laughs> and for one of my favorite people, uh, Steve Wozniak, a.k.a. Woz, goes something like this. If you try to make such projects unseen by others, as perfect as any human could, you'll develop skills that other professionals don't have. So ponder on that and see you guys next time. Exactly.